Welcome, Detlef. Uh, it's my very special pleasure to have you here for our Berta Lanfi interview. This is what we usually do with our Berta Lanfi speakers, just to give the general audience a, a deeper insight into the way you eventually became a scientist. So this is what, what we're trying to do, because it's, it's a little bit abstract and the impression people on the street have of scientists is usually very well determined by movies. And as you know, in movies, mm -hmm. scientists are always mad scientists. And what I try to show you, sh not show you, show the others with you here is, no, scientists aren't mad. We, we don't want to kill the world. We want to maybe save the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We have our personal motivation, our personal history of, of career. And I think this is what I'll try to go into today and just tickle you a bit that, that the audience learns a little bit more about how one scientific career has been happening in your case and in in the total perspective with all the others they will see that well scientists are just humans yeah thank you Jürgen. that's indeed true um, all those scientists have sometimes of course have a, a lot of enthusiasm yeah um, I, my way into science um, has been indeed um, very special, I would say, but in a in a certain way also probably typical in that I think all the scientists have have something like a, their special avenue into science. And um, for me, I mean, it obviously began with with studies. You have to study to become a scientist. In my case, it was did, did it happen biology just, just when you studied? I, I just wonder because no, sometimes it, there are well key events in mm -hmm. childhood or during school. Yeah, during was, was there anything that happened? I must was it your parents? Was it your family? Were they uh, had the affinity to science and and just that impacted on you? Um, of course, the parents parents do play a role. So my my mom is a biology teacher, has been biology teacher. She is of course retired now. Um, what my my first I think way into biology was probably that I did my civil deans, that is the civil service that we did at this, replacing the military service at that time, um, that was an environmental protection. So I went to the island of Sylt in the North Sea for uh, my regular 20 months. And um, during that time, so that was, a, I would say, a, a very important time for me. I really enjoyed it. And during that time, um, in a way, wanted to become a biologist because I was interested in environmental protection. I still am. But at that time, um, this was a decision, of course, I'm going to study biology and, of course, continue along this path. So this was, I think, most of my entry into biology, in fact. And then um, you, you start to study. And then you went from north to south, right? You went along the Rhine to, to Freiburg and... This is what That's I would recall. Quite, quite a distance. Everybody um, to change place. I enjoyed that a lot. I thought this was a very nice thing to do. I really wanted to go somewhere else. So I, coming from the north of Hamburg in Schleswig-Holstein, I um, decided to go to Freiburg in Breisgau, to Baden-Württemberg. And, um, did and that did was, you understand the language? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is Badisch. Meanwhile, um, I became much more familiar, of course. I, I think I still in German have a slight Hamburg accent. But um, my, I wanted to, to be as far away from home at that time within Germany as possible, I must admit. And I thought this was a good decision. So I, I did enjoy Freiburg. And in, in your studies, was there a moment, because that's something that, that students always ask, is, has there ever been a moment where we, you knew what you're going to do for your career? Mm -hmm. I think so. And, and that was when I found out that there is something called developmental biology. I had no idea before. This was really happening during my studies. As I said, I was starting as an enthusiastic ecologist. And, but then, of course, you get a broad education. And part of this education was developmental biology with, with Klaus Sander and Katharina Dübler-Jung at that time in Freiburg. And I just found it very interesting. Um, I hadn't known about, about it before. And um, this intriguing process to have, a, have an egg, 
that out of nothing, out of the blue, develops into an embryo. And everything, all the mechanisms involved, they're starting to be um, unraveled at the molecular level at that time. I thought this was really interesting. So both the embryology and also the molecular biology. And that was really caught my interest. I, I must say, I, I thought this was exciting. And I thought, go deeper into it. What was that... Uh an extended period or was it just like a single event where you see okay it it struck you like lightning and and suddenly you knew this is it or it was a, a process where you would say okay thrilling more thrilled more thrilled and then you knew the um, I think the process was to discover that I was really interested in brain development and nervous system development mm -hmm. so that became during all these practicals where we dissected animals, during all the lectures where we heard about all the diversity in the animal kingdom, I was always interested in brain and nervous system. And so that built up over the years. And But there was, I think there were two moments where I got really intrigued. And one of them was when I heard, of course, as a student, about um, the Hox genes, mm. how they work. Yeah, and that there is this fundamental um, relationship between body plan and its regions from front to from back to front, and um, a certain class of genes, the Hox genes, that specify this, that are involved. So that was something that I found really interesting. Um, the second was then, and that that brought me into research then. And I think this was my Heureka moment, the moment where I said, okay, this is cool, this is what I'm gonna do, um, was when with a few other students, we, we went into the modern literature, we had our um, lecturers who were more into morphology, we studied the molecular biology and um, heard about all the genes being involved in development, you know, you know it. And, um, but there was a day when in fact, I noted for myself that all the genes that played a role in, in the fly on the ventral side where, where the nervous system is located, that these genes were in fact now also discovered in mouse and they played a role on the dorsal side, also where the nervous system was located. So there was something like a very strange discrepancy that, that everything that was on the belly side in, in the fly was on the, on the back side in the vertebrate. And then I checked and in the literature nobody had noted that. Um, this was, in a way, a real discovery. And um, then I thought, well, there must be something about back and belly corresponding. Yeah. And I thought about it for a few days. I went deeper into it, looked for more genes. They were all telling the same story. And then I finally went to, to one of my profs and said, you know, I have <laughs> discovered something here. There is something very strange about genes expressed on opposite body, body sides. Um, this must mean something. So I thought, why not that there was something like a dorsal ventral axis inversion in, in one of the two, so that they simply flipped upside down. And um, this actually developed into something. And, and for me, um, this was fascinating. I loved this. So I thought, how is this possible that as, as a student, you can, um, in, a, in a millisecond in a way, come to the forefront of research, see something, and then um, even publish it. And um, so that... That, I think, was my, my moment where I think I was decided that I'm going to follow the academic career. In, in your path to eventually running a lab, you had a phase where you first started working in a lab and then decided, mm, probably I, I don't continue in the lab, but rather continue in working on papers, reviews, mm -hmm. searching the literature. And what made you take that route initially? Well, I think my, my general message is that as a scientist, you should always follow your interests and your gut feeling because this is what is driving you, this makes you good. Um, and when I was, after this discovery that, that there might be something about the dorsal ventral axis inversion, um, there was a lot to, f to read and a lot of old literature simply to study. Mm. Because as it is always in science, People had this idea before and there has been a lot of writing in this and that direction and discussion. 
and at least, I don't know, a thousand papers that I had to read and that I wanted to read and um, that I also wanted to, to integrate in, in, in my new theory. Would, would you think that this is a good advice for starting scientists to have a list of a thousand papers to read before they do whatever? Well, I think you should read, yes. I yeah, think you, that, it, that's it clear. Depends. But... Um, I would actually say not necessarily. If you are more an experimental person and you are really into tackling a problem and you know I have two right hands and I can really do it, then that's your way into science. If, if you are more a, a reader and integrative brain, yeah, then your way into science is maybe to really work yourself into a problem. And um, what I would say is that there are many ways into science and what is important is that you, you follow your curiosity. And I would still maintain that. I, mm. I did that at my time, also following some paths that, that people didn't consider <laughs> the direct path into science at that time. Um, I would in principle say this is still true because um, when you are really working close to your interest and your heart, you are good at it. And when you're good at it, people notice and, and somehow say, okay, here's somebody coming with a mission um, in science and this is still, I think, very much liked. Mission in science. Yeah. So what was your mission when you were much younger, when you just started as a PhD student? What was your mission? Well, my, my mission in my, my PhD work was to really get down to the grounds of nervous system comparisons across animals. Um, this has always been an open question in, in evolution and zoology. So how does this brain in the fly really relate to what we have in our head, to our brain in, in humans. And this relates to the question, where do we come from? Where does our brain come from? And can we learn something about, for example, the last common ancestor of human and fly? Yeah, what, what was in the head? So this, this was clearly the question I was, was fascinated by, still am. And, and I think this was the first. So the, the close interplay between development and eventually evolution. Yeah, this is... it started, exactly, I, I started with development, I would say I, I ended up in evolution, <laughs> yeah, the two are linked, yeah. so there is a, a lot to learn about evolution by looking into development, there still is, and um, so starting with a fascination of, of um, the developing brain, I developed this, this deep interest into where brains come from. How, how is this can evolve in, in animals? It did evolve, obviously. And what was the driving force? What did the first versions, the prototypes, brains 1.0 look like? And so on. And this is still something that, that you're pursuing, right? You, you started out with the idea already at, at your PhD, maybe even earlier, with the axis inversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it started with my, my PhD was this theoretical work that you mentioned, where I then really sat down and, and just read everything. There is a lot of literature on also anatomical comparisons between brains. And I thought, you need to know all this if you really want to make a sound contribution to, to this field. Um, you have to know what, what was known before. And I still recommend that. Get really, get a deep insight into your research field. This is also what what you mentioned, so I decided for my PhD something that was really not advised to, to, <laughs> to not work molecularly uh, during that time and um, do a theoretical PhD with writing reviews. Um, and I did start then, of course, after my PhD with, with molecular work. I remember that. Yes. That, so that, what, what made you eventually pick up pipettes and, and do experiments in the lab? What was the, the key element driving you forward? Because you've been very successful in, in doing theoretical biology. But what, what moved you into running a lab eventually? Well, here I should say that um, it was one of my um, big mentors, and that is you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I came into Jochen's lab at that time. And um, I think there was a clear advice that if you really want to establish yourself as a scientist, um, there also has to be molecular work. And I, w I felt it myself that having, having read that much and having come up with these hypotheses how things might relate, there was obviously data missing. And um, I did agree then that the 
theoretical time was over and I wanted to use pipettes myself, learn about molecular biology. And I must say that taking somebody, Jochen was starting his, his lab himself at that time and at Ambil was pretty new. And accepting somebody who had no clue about molecular biology in the molecular li li biology laboratory, working yet on another organism, was actually very courageous from, <laughs> from Jochen's side. But yeah, he did so. I, I heard other birds about that. <laughs> but. Yes. So, but that was a plan. And um, also the, to, to learn molecular biology, um, there was, it was not that difficult because at the end I had to work myself into cloning genes, finding genes in organisms where they had never been um, discovered before. So in, for example, in, so in some weird organism that we then identified. And um, molecularly and procedure-wise, that's not that difficult. So in a way, it is cloning genes and, and doing Wilmot in situ, which carried me quite some forward, quite some distance. Um, but of course, it was a completely new field at that time. Um, it was good. I, I thought I enjoyed all, also the molecular work. I mean, everybody has to find their balance, how you do it best. I'm a very, I was, I think, slow, but then very focused. I didn't do many mistakes, but it took me time. So somehow then planned the experiments very well, then finally did them. And, and um, things were there. Yeah, things were there. Yeah, so your career ran unusual. So if, if you ask someone, what do you have to do to get a scientific career? They would say, okay, you have to go abroad, ideally to the US uh, or another English speaking country and, and do a postdoc there, maybe a second postdoc and a group mm -hmm. at another place and then move again and again and again. In your case, that was not that. There was some move, moving involved, but that was more early. You left home, you went to Freiburg, and then, well, <coughs> Freiburg, Heidelberg is, is not too distant, but you've been in between doing theoretical work. Uh, so do you think there is, there, there is really advice to move far in well, there, order to have a, a good chance for a career? Well, there clearly was strong advice to do so. I know. <laughs> We all know, I mean, at that time, and also now, the advice is to go abroad, um, maybe still best to the US, to, to um, spend at least some time in a different research environment, to, to benefit maybe for also from the spirit that, that is still there in, 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 in Great Britain or the US, I think. I just didn't do it, um, following my own heart, and that I thought um, it, it, I would, well, I would f be able to do what I wanted to do in, in Jochen's lab. Um, that was, I think, a unique opportunity. I'm not sure whether I, how motivated I was at that time to, to go abroad completely. I don't think that much. So in a way, I, I like to stay um, in, in Germany. Um, I didn't give much about the necessity to go abroad. Um, from today's perspective, I think, I would, I would also advise it. I think going abroad is great. It actually gives you, um, it gives you experiences that you cannot gain if you always stay at the same pl place. Having said that, I did stay always in Baden-Württemberg. My scientific career um, never left Baden-Württemberg. Um, I ended up at Embel, though, which is... Um, oh, that's extraterritorial. Yeah, that's this extraterritorial. Doesn't it doesn't count. It, but it, it's gives a different you, it gives you, in fact, a lot of international yeah. contact. And, and I think, meanwhile, yeah, it is, it is a very specific research landscape there that, that, in a way, makes you very international. You're talking about research landscape, and I think this is one of the other questions I always get asked. How do you find your way? How do you know what is going to happen next in your lab strategically, where things are developing to? Is that just gut feeling because you know the field, because you sense uh, there is something here and there and this is how I can contribute and really push the field further? Or how, how does it work in practical terms? Or do you sit and, and read specifically to decide, okay, the next thing is going to be this or that? It needs, it's in phases, right? It is, um, there are phases where you need to work yourself, focus on a question that you're excited about, 
fall into your rabbit hole and really enjoy it for, for some weeks. To, to work yourself into a new question, be excited by it, yeah, solving the puzzle. Equally important is that you step out again and then um, communicate with colleagues, with friends about um, what you have been thinking. And that's, I think, equally important. So after all these years, I think these, these two elements have to alternate. Um, I Very often when I'm on conferences, when I'm then really immersed in, in the scientific community, there's a lot of aha moments where I said, okay, this was maybe a good idea, but it is not really, um, it doesn't really hold in reality. And there are actually better ideas out there. Or other people have long solved this. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it is an interesting, I, I would say, alternation of, of phases where you really, I think you need to be on your own, um, sort of think and, and follow your, your interests and then um, kind of testing it with your colleagues and friends. And um, I think this is both is enjoyable, but also this scientific discussion is, is always great. I, I still enjoy it a lot. So you, you describe that more or less like a process of a, of a growth cone that, that tries to find its way. It's sniffing left and right and eventually extending directly frontal. Yeah, the growth cone is yourself and your, yeah. your interests and your ideas that you pursue. But you, you always, you sometimes are just in the wrong territory and you need to find out by, exactly, this very nice image, by, by, by signal, receiving signals and maybe also averse signals mm -hmm. that this is just bullshit and <laughs> you rather go into that direction and then you do. Yeah. So it's a, almost an evolutionary process. Kind of, or a developmental. Or a developmental, or a combination. Or yeah. a combination. So the growth zone thing would require a lot of activity at, at the forefront, right? You need to maintain your creativity and curiosity. Uh, without that, you can't extend your ideas into new directions. How do you maintain that? Why, why don't you get bored and tired? And hmm. um, what, what is well, the, the internal tough. drive or the, the self-recharging mechanism or secret? I think that's deeply human. That's curiosity. I'm, I'm just interested in that stuff. I, I still isn't, am. Isn't that something where you're always told this is something for kids and when you're grown up, you're serious? Yeah, we're you scientists know, and kids, I think. Yeah, we are. That, that never changed. I, I, I think it's still the same feeling that I had as a 10-year-old boy. Um, it's, you're just intrigued by something. You want to find out. It's, uh, you, you also have it when you play, actually, when you, when you play with Lego, what, what I was really into or, or yeah. Um, it's, it's the same curiosity. And as a scientist, you, you just keep it. Science, science is, a, is a field where you can, in, in fact, just follow and play for your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> play sounds a little bit like waste your time, but... Well, you find out about something. You yeah. find out about something. It's useful them. for society. Yeah. It always is. And the more you follow your instincts and your curiosity, the better you are and the more in-depth playing you do in, in, with, with the elements that you encounter and, and resorting it and coming up with, with a completely new model, um, the better. And um, basic science is about that. It's, it's about curious scientists um, playing around with things, finding something, solving little riddles, um, and, and this way advancing our human knowledge. I mean, that's, that's basically a very simple picture, but I think it's, it's as simplistic as it sounds it is. When, when you're developing into new directions, you often don't just develop your own lab into a new direction, but you really open a new field. Is that something that you think is planned or is that happening in a similar process just as described with the growth cone, just on a different scale mm. where people eventually realize, oh, there is a lot of opportunity and this is... Uh, this is the way it happens. It's more a, a kind of synergistic process rather than something that is planned. It happens with this communication process, right? It happens during these phases when you interchange with your fellow scientists, when, when you have these opportunities. On a, it's often on conferences where there's just a small group and you, you discuss or you just present it or your colleague just present it and, and you discuss then in a certain direction. Often it is it's five minutes. There were a few really important um, insights. Are con people confront each other with, with these ideas. They all realize, okay, this is a magic moment. Um, and there is really a, a, even a field to go into, a whole new area. We have, we have unlocked something. There's a new 
interesting science space yeah, in front of us. And, but I think it depends on, on your willingness and other people's willingness to talk about it. That's not always the case. I mean, some scientists are afraid of communication almost and, and are kind of locked in. And I think that's not fruitful. Yeah? In a way, you gain a lot and, and the, the field gains a lot if, if you play with open cards. In, in all science, of course, eventually depends on funding. And when, when it comes to science funding, there, there are two, I think, almost opposite modes of funding. One is where the funding agency tell you what to do. Mm. And the other is where you have the freedom and eventually you just have to justify your, what you've been doing. Of course, you always come up with a proposal, but the initial idea is not coming from the funding agency or the politics but rather from the signs. Mm -hmm. um, more and more, I have the feeling that we're told what to do rather than allowed to follow our intrinsic cues that, as you describe it, are really resulting in, in important and novel discoveries rather than in something that has been kind of predefined mm -hmm. as the next area of research. How would you relate these things? How would you see that the future of science and the freedom of creativity uh, can survive in a setting that is, is getting more and more restricted or, conf let's say, confined? That sounds more positive than restricted. Yeah. Um, I very much agree that there are these two directions to fund science. Um, I think it's needless to say that um, I think the curiosity-driven basic research funding is extremely important. Um, and it's also true that this is always threatened. Yeah? It is, um, I, I think, to, to phrase it positively, we are in a luxurious situation that in, the, in Europe there is the ERC, the European Research Council, which I think up to today is ready to fund crazy basic science yeah with people coming up with ideas um, novel ideas that have not been planned that have not been asked for and there is there are experts who see this and say yeah this is cool this is new this is high risk but also high gain uh, we want to have this and we are funding this and this is really not taken for granted yeah we we know from the us that the research landscape is is much more um, adverse to this doesn't really many people complain there that it's they are not really funding this this kind of basic research even in the UK um, this seems to be under threat as um, for not so obvious reasons the the country that has in a way the best academic curiosity driven tradition yeah even they um, have the tendency to be much more um, moving into applied and and predefined research. Um, so we have these um, in, in, in Europe with the ERC, I think, and, and other agency, also the, the DFG in Germany, I think, funds, still funds basic research and is dedic devoted to do so. Um, so we have this, at least we have the choice between both avenues. Yeah? And I, I think um, cutting these basic research funding um, strategies is a bad idea. Yeah, very much agreed. Yeah. Let's talk about something more well, exciting, because this is, is uh, maybe daily work and that would require a, a discussion on its own, but this is not too much about you. Um, at EMBL, you've, you've been starting something and, and you're heading the planetary biology. This is something that goes far beyond the thing that had, you had initially been doing with with your lab, is, is that the, the synthesis of your initial ideas back on SILT where you wanted to protect environment and now all the way understanding development and evolution and now you're, you're putting both things together and mm. you look at, at the thing from, from an even higher height and new perspective, is, is that the way yeah. we could understand that? Yes. I would, I would say so. It's a, it's a little bit of a back to the roots. I, I, I came from environmental research and in the moment at, at, at Embel and also at other places we are coming back to that. I think um, to appreciate that one has to understand that developmental biology was for a long time 
shielding itself off from environmental influences. We had to because this is how developmental genetics work. So you have to make sure that things are reproducible and that basically means you don't want to have different conditions in every experiment you are doing. And, and so you, you more or less study, keep your objects in a, in, a, in a shielded space where the environment doesn't play a role. And, and with technical advances, um, it's more and more possible to actually embrace environment and study your, for example, your developmental organism, developing organism under many different conditions and also your, your adult organisms under many different conditions, even at the molecular level, because we can now um, yeah, get much more data for different conditions with different experimental approaches that make it possible. And, and um, this has, I think, now allowed a, a, a new life I think almost a change of paradigm in, in life sciences that um, we are not only devoted to basic research that at the end feeds into health, yeah, human health, but now it's also planetary health. It is um, in a way accepting the challenge that, that there, are, um, there are a lot of problems in the moment and with the planet, we have a problem with our planetary environment, <laughs> there's climate change. And we now have experimental strategies that we can understand the organism, organism in the context, life in context. There's also a very strong pillar here at, at COS, yeah, that, that um, this is a very important, yeah, as I said, new direction for the entire life sciences that we can now delve into. And this is what um, is also my function at EMBL now as a, as a co-chair of what we call planetary biology to make this possible, to enable this kind of research and to, to kind of bundle our, our activities into this new research direction. You, you mentioned it in, in that context, and this is a general trend in, in sciences, there is more and more and more data accumulating and the interpretation of data eventually is, is almost impossible without the help of artificial intelligence. So how, how do you see the future contribution of artificial intelligence interpreting our data? Is, is that something that, that you feel happy about? Is, is there some, some opinion? Because to some extent, we've given up to believe in, in religion, but we have no problem believing in AI. Mm. It's a, that's a very important, interesting topic that I think we are all very concerned about in the moment. It's both, it's both an opportunity and also a challenge for us as scientists. Um, I would phrase it like this. Um, it is a very powerful tool and it is, goes directly into what we feel is our spe special capacity as scientists is its association. It is um, pattern recognition. We, we, um, we very often have moments where we say, ah, oh, there was something. This is, I remember two years ago, I read a paper that this molecule is doing something in this direction and now I see it again and then you dig it out and you see, ah, oh, there were other molecules involved and I find them here as well. And especially in this comparative research that I'm doing myself, um, there's a lot of this um, where, where there are specific associations that you make yourself um, that lead you into something new. And one, one has to admit that AI is very good at that. And the computer knows everything. Yeah? I mean, if you have the whole internet knowledge, yeah, everything that is somewhere published <laughs> in your brain, um, of course that is very powerful. So we know, I think, that AI is an extremely powerful tool. And it is, of course, it will be in, in a certain or it is already better than us in, in certain directions that we considered our special capacity. Um, so yes, I do think that AI is a challenge in that we will have to operate with a tool that is better than us in a field that is in a way the heart of scientific work. Yeah? And we have to see where this leads us. I think if, if you just play it a little bit further, at the moment there is still scientists trained the traditional way mm. and they can evaluate what is better than us. But if you're, if you're looking a few years forward, this 
perception may not be possible any longer because it's accepted that everything AI does is, is close to perfect. And that old experience of having things here and there and dragging things together is not part of the capacity of the scientist, but part of the capacity of the tool. Mm -hmm. Do you think this will touch the heart of science? Oh, yes. I think you phrased it very well. That means nothing less than us accepting that there is something smarter than us, that in a way we Is, is it smart it. or is it just it more is smarter in the knowledgeable? Way, because it is more knowledgeable. Well, smart is then the question how you define it. It is more knowledgeable. It has capacities that go beyond ours in certain areas. Yeah. Of course, we haven't just discussed ethical compass and, and all of this, right? So, but um, it is, we, will, we might be not the last um, instance in, at the end, deciding whether something that AI has found is, is good or bad or, or true or false, because we might not even not be in the position to judge that. Yeah. Yeah, so we might not understand it. And that is something deeply philosophical that we might steer in the moment in a situation where we have to accept that something else is smarter. In, and we cannot really understand even how it got there. We can just maybe validate whether it is useful or not in solving problems, but it's not coming from our brain. And it has, and um, this I find very interesting. True, I find it interesting. I think eventually it's somehow coming from our brain because it's just a machine mm. that was trained to combine everything and all the knowledge. And that machine was built by someone, but that someone doesn't have to be smarter than the machine. I, I would agree. No, I think it's exciting. It, it really goes into old uh, science fiction that I read when I was young. Yeah. And I think these are very exciting days. We hear, hear AI here and there and everywhere. And of course, if we're, if we're not using it, we're outcompeted. And this is how I would also, I would agree. Yes, we have to use it. Um, it is clearly going, especially in those disciplines that um, integrate a lot of data. Mm. And um, so for, for the research we are doing, that is comparative comparisons ac across all organisms, um, is, is clearly something where AI will be very good. And um, so evolution is, is one of the fields where the, it hasn't even started yet, but it is already clear that there will be a strong contribution and, and we will have to accept that and use it. Um, and this comes, is coming now. Uh, it comes in the next years and, and we will see what so the results are. For, for science, I think AI will be not useless, but it, it will be very important not only to use AI, but also maintain the spirit of research. Otherwise, AI is, is just building on something that we can't, absolutely can't evaluate. And I think if, if that step is taken, mm. it's, it's, it's just unleashed and Mm. For me, it would be difficult uh, to see a generation of, of young scientists who haven't experienced what we experience and still be able to judge the quality of things that are promoted by AI. Yes, AI is... Um... Is, is, is... Do you have anything in mind that would help or could help to keep grounded? and educate a new generation of scientists. This is for the young people mm. maybe watching. Educate a new generation of scientists that, that find an anchor. It's, it's extremely difficult because AI knows everything. So the complete anchor is there. But uh, otherwise I would say science is obsolete. It's all there and all we have to do is write the right prompt. And this could be done by a politician and get an answer that is complete. Well, you can still argue that the complete novelty yeah, is something where that might still come from us. So to, to, to steer, for example, then the AI into, into a field that were not apparent before. Um, and I think the, the, the judgment is out there whether this will still be only on us or to what extent AI will be 
creative itself. I think my advice is um, we should not we should not not learn this capacity to to read, to be curious about something, to associate and do it ourselves, and then maybe accept that AI can can help us with it. But if we give up on on this capacity, which is the, the heart of being a scientist, we will no longer be scientists, and then we will really just have to accept what AI does. So I think we have to keep going. We have to learn how to use it very efficiently as scientific instrument. We have to find a way of keeping the control, also, yeah, that that we know where it's going, and at the end that we have the last word <laughs> as, as humans, and will not be easy, I think. It is, it is um, not clear exactly how, how good, how efficient it will be, how fast this will happen, but I think um, we have to keep our creativity, which is something we learned, which is something we learned during our studies, which requires a lot of reading, yeah, to, to actually remain scientific minds ourselves. I think that's um, an excellent closing remark. Keep your creativity and do it yourself. Only then you will feel the excitement of, wow, I've discovered something. I think this is, at least for me, and I guess also for you, this is what drives us forward. And this is what makes us really crawl through the mud and explore new avenues. Thank you very much. That, that, that has been really very interesting, exciting, and the AI direction is something we could continue discussing forever. But let's see that we A, learn how to use it and ideally also find a way to control it for the best of science and humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jochen. It was a really nice conversation. Good.